give a brief description of the origin and characteristics of the emerging church before we trace its relationship to pre-Vatican II Catholicism. All right. For this present, uh, for parts of this presentation and others, I, I've uh, I, I've been indebted to Dr. John Markovich. Uh, he's a uh, church history professor at Andrews University, who is about to come out with uh, a major study as a historian on the emerging church. Um, and so a lot of my descriptions will come from some of his presentations. And by the way, you can access his presentations, and I would encourage you to do so if you're familiar with Audioverse. How many of you are familiar with Audioverse? Yeah. You can look up Dr. John Markovich's presentations on Audioverse, and uh, they will be a tremendous blessing to you. All right. Uh, it's beginning as a movement. Uh, it's a, it was a small group of mostly evangelical Protestants like B Brian McLaren, Tony Jones, Doug Paget, and they were dissatisfied with traditional Christianity and they began to communicate together. What, what you're going to find out is that their interpretation of, of traditional Christianity is basically historic Protestantism. Protestants who believed in uh, or, and still believe in the sola scriptura principle that, that they believe that the Bible is authoritative and that actually preaching is the main ritual in the worship service. So they're very dissatisfied with, with, with them. In June 2001, they began to call themselves the emerging church, yet interestingly enough, others had also described them by the same title you're going to find that although they kind of came to fruition in 2000, 2001, uh, the very title Emerging Church preceded them. And you'll, uh, you'll find out how that took place. Brian McLaren has been described as the Moses of our time who's been sent to deliver us out of traditional Christianity, meaning traditional Protestantism. All right? So that gives you a little bit of a, mag uh, a little magnitude as to... How they, how they see themselves in relationship to traditional Protestantism and what, uh, and what, their, what their kind of goals and missions are. Let's, let's look at, um, let's describe them and look at, note some of their characteristics. Uh, they see themselves as innovators who want to deal with uh, the mass exodus of mostly young people from the church. But what they're suggesting is not a mere cosmetic change. And this is really what I, what I, what I want to get across. And if I fail to get that across, um, uh, then I really haven't done my work here. And if you and I don't grasp that the emerging church is really a change at the most fundamental philosophical and theological levels, then we will not be prepared at all for the tsunami. Not prepared at all. So when they talk about innovation and change, this is not just a mere cosmetic change, you know, just brushing up the outside. No, this is a fundamental change uh, at the most fundamental philosophical and theological uh, um, uh, levels. So their aim is to deconstruct traditional Christianity, meaning mainline Protestantism deconstruct that's a very important word for philosophy uh, and deconstruct means exactly that uh, if you were to deconstruct this building the way they interpret the word deconstruct then you're just not taking apart you know some of the the heating and cooling and some of the roof no 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 you're tearing it up from the very foundations okay and that's what they mean by deconstruct their aim is also ecumenical unity not religious uniformity, and this applies to all religions. Their vision is much broader than just Christianity. Their vision includes all of the religions of the world. All right? Uh, the emerging church is a new way of doing Christianity, a new way of thinking, a new world view. Um, and as we begin to discuss its, its fundamental changes, we'll be into that word worldview. Uh, a worldview is how you look at God, how you look at the world, how you look at yourself, um, and how you understand their interpretations and their interrelationships. Theistic evolution is woven into the very structure and being of the emerging church. It's impossible to understand it without understanding how theistic evolution works. So let me back up. What, you, you have your own idea of what theistic evolution is. Um, uh, 
But, and it's impossible to understand it without knowing what theistic evolution is and how it works. You will not be able to understand the emerging church without it, period. Emergence does not mean becoming or coming out. It means evolving and going through an evolutionary process. Okay, we're, we're, we're talking about changes at the most fundamental levels. But most of us experience the emerging church from church. And so you look at the, you know, their worship innovation and you'll say, hey, what's, what's wrong with that? And pretty much the mindset of some Adventists, whether they're administrators or educators, is that as long as we have the 28 fundamental beliefs, then how we express them is entirely based on our culture. Okay? Well, we're going to be chipping away at that fundamental presupposition that you might have because nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the doctrines that we have, especially the pillars that we're going to introduce a little bit later on, are not just, um, uh, they exercise a, I'm trying to search for the, for the non-technical word, but they, they have a hermeneutical function. In other words, when you talk about the Sabbath, the sanctuary, the state of the dead, and some of these other pillars that Ellen White is going to identify for us, these are not just little doctrines that you put side by side with other doctrines, no. When we understand what these pillars are, they become the lenses through which we understand the rest of the doctrines of Scripture. So they are formative. And in philosophy, they do something very similar as well. Um, and so uh, this, is, uh, this is incredibly important. Okay, so they see themselves as the kingdom of God in the making. Um, postmodern theology is at the center of their thinking. You kind of heard that we're in the postmodern era, okay? In the, in, in the pre-modern era, if you wanted to know how many teeth are in the head of a horse, well, you couldn't quite figure that out. You had to ask the philosopher uh, because he was the only one that could, that could understand that. Um, if you're in the modern era, you're talking like uh, enlightenment period, which by the way wasn't very enlightening. Um, you're talking enlightenment period, seventh, late 17th, 18th century. If you want to know how many teeth are in the head of a horse, you just open up the horse's mouth and you count. All right. In the postmodern era, uh, what you think is a horse is not really a horse. It could be anything. All right. Um, and so uh, that's just, it's just a horse to you. I mean, to somebody else, it could be a cow or it could be a sheep or it could be a dolphin. And, you know, that's okay, uh, according to the postmodern uh, mindset. Um, there's no center at all. There's no uh, meta narrative. That means there's no story that encompasses all other stories. Do we as Adventists have a story that encompasses just about everything? Amen. Yeah, it's called the <laughs> great controversy, is it not? <laughs> Everything that happens exists within that framework of the great controversy. And that great controversy then has incredible explanatory value when you're trying to analyze all of the rest of what's happening in the world as, far, as well as how we should understand our doctrinal teachings. But with one bold stroke, it's gone. Okay? And our great controversy is just as good as whatever narrative or story that anybody else comes up with. And all narratives are of equal value. Well, that statement is problematic because don't you have to have some external measure in order to judge what is of equal value in order to say that something is of equal value? Who determines whether it's of equal value or not? And uh, folk today in the emerging church are spiritual rather than religious. Um, and they ridicule doctrine and doctrinal differences. And if you come from a, a, you know, from a biblical Adventist mindset where, you know, white is white and black is black, and this is the Sabbath, and that's Sunday, and so forth, you're thinking that you can just show them a simple text, and everything will be okay. <laughs> uh, and you're wondering what planet they're on, and they're wondering what planet you're from as well. All right, let's look at their worship experience. Um, their worship experience can be ex uh, described as experiential and participatory. Now, you know, a lot of these things there's nothing wrong with in and of themselves. I mean, we, you know, we should be having an experience with Jesus in the worship service and uh, we should participate. Innovation is in. Well, again, there's nothing wrong with innovation per se, but if you look at the second commandment, there are limits that are placed on our creativity and our innovation. When you're, when you're trying to figure out what the concept of God is, you can't confuse that with nature. Right? You've got to halt there and say, hey, we can't go there. There are no prescribed rules about worship space, how to do worship, when to do worship. 
There are no guidelines there. Uh, it's very informal. Uh, spaces are designed for meditation and prayer, and um, we'll talk about what they mean by meditation and prayer a little bit later on. Um, something else they say, uh, they say that uh, everything changes, everything has changed, and therefore uh, everything must change. Is that true? No, the human heart hasn't changed, has it? I mean, I, I, have you been noticing that we're, we're getting better and better and better? I mean, <laughs> we're getting kinder and uh, more Christ-like. Uh, everything is moving in a wonderful direction. No, that isn't true. The fundamental questions asked by human beings over the centuries have not changed either. Uh, what is ultimate reality? What is the nature of external reality? What is a human being? What happens at death? Why is there evil suffering? You know, those questions haven't, haven't changed. Why is it possible to know anything at all, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Um, if you're going to understand Catholicism, I teach a, a history class, a um, history of Christianity class. And, uh, and, and if you're going to study early, history, early church history, it is impossible to understand Catholicism outside of Greek philosophy. Now, we're going to be tearing up Greek philosophy here. And so, is anybody Greek out there? No? Just me? All right. All right. So, <laughs> you, know, you know the old saying, you know, when... Uh, when uh, if an ambassador to the United States criticizes the president, that's one thing. But uh, when somebody else from another nation criticizes the president, you know, that's, that's, that's quite a different matter. So my criticism of Greek philosophy is coming from a Greek, all right? So, uh, <laughs> uh, yes, they did a lot of wonderful things. They were excellent thinkers. But uh, how they interpreted reality was latched on by the Roman Catholic Church and has become extremely problematic for all of Christianity. So we're going to look at Greek philosophy, Catholicism, and the sola scriptura principle. Again, we're studying the emerging church, but it's, it is impossible to understand the emerging church without a knowledge of pre-Vatican II Catholicism. Absolutely impossible. Okay, now, if this is news for you, Greek philosophy is the foundation upon which Catholicism is built, and this is kind of illustrated by the books of Daniel and Revelation. If you take a close look at Daniel and Revelation in Daniel 2, 7, I'm not sure how much of this we're going to go through. Okay, maybe just Daniel 2. Okay, yeah, we're going to go through the whole shebang. All right, uh, this is from, so the, the Bible here is informing us that there is a, a great relationship between Greece and Rome, okay? In Daniel chapter 2, Greece is represented by belly and thighs of bronze and Rome by legs of iron. The thigh, according to, uh, 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 if you do, a, if you do a, a word study and look up the Aramaic and cross-reference that with the Hebrew, the thigh represents the hind limb extending from the hip to the knee. Now, how many of you have been to evangelistic series and you see the image of Daniel 2 and, you, you know, the guy's kind of wearing a miniskirt, you know, for, you know, for, the, for, for the bronze kingdom? Okay, well, okay. That doesn't quite match up with the, with the reality here, all right? And so this is saying that the, that the belly and thighs of bronze actually extend from the hind limb to, to the knee. The Bible actually teaches that everything above the knees was made of bronze. You can see Daniel 2.32 and Genesis chapter 24, verse 9. In Genesis chapter 24, verse 9, Isaac is about to get married. Abraham is about to send a servant out to find a wife. And, and he says, swear unto me that you're going to do this for me. And part of, that, part of that swearing is he put his hand under his thigh. All right. So the leg is a single entity divided between the upper half, the Greeks, and the lower half, the Romans. History points to the close relationship between Greece and Rome. You may be thinking, ah, you know, that's ah, maybe not the best example. Okay, we'll move on. Daniel chapter 7, verse 19, the fourth beast that, that had iron teeth, it also has nails of brass. Now, if you go back to Daniel chapter 2, well, you've got the head of gold, chest and arms of silver, and then belly and thighs of brass or bronze. Uh, here, the fourth beast has iron teeth, just like the iron legs, but it has nails of brass. Well, that points back to Greece. So the iron teeth point to the legs of, uh, of iron in Daniel 2, and the brass is a symbol of Greece in Daniel 2. Well, in Daniel chapter 8, verse 21, the, the, the goat refers to the Greeks. 
Greece is then linked up with the Romans and the papacy in the shape of a little horn. That little horn represents both the papal and the, uh, the pagan and the papal aspects of, uh, of Catholicism. And then Greece's head is broken up into four, which parallel the four heads of, in Daniel 7. Now there's a little horn which, which represents both pagan and papal Rome. Uh, this is Edwin de Kock's, um, this is, by the way, an incredible book, Seven Heads and Ten Horns in Daniel and the Revelation. The Mediterranean apostasy was deeply imbued with Hellenism. It was this that deeply engaged the Lord's attention and is reflected in Bible prophecy. Again, the same thing happens in Daniel 11. You have, uh, you know, the king of the north and the king of the south. And there's a transition between the king of the north representing Rome and the king of the north representing Greece without a change in the symbol at all. And so basically this is saying that there's no transition to mark the Greeks and the Romans as separate peoples. Rome grew out of Greece. Perhaps, to me, the best example is Revelation 13. You have a beast coming up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns, and he has the body of a leopard. The largest part of that animal in Revelation chapter 13 is the leopard. And if you trust, this is a very long Bible study, short, and so if you, if you go back to Daniel chapter 7, so I'm assuming a lot, if you go back to Daniel chapter 7, the leopard represented Greece. That is the largest part of that animal in Revelation chapter 13, which comes up out of the, which comes up out of the sea. Um, so the frame of that is Greece. So what are some of the implications? Well, Greece had a dualistic philosophy that came from Parmenides, um, Plato, and Aristotle. You know, when I, when I studied philosophy, Parmenides was in Italy, but he's a Greek philosopher, and I'm thinking, I'm not getting something here. <laughs> what? He's a Greek philosopher, and he's in Italy. Why couldn't he be an Italian philosopher? Well, because of what Edwin de Kock has been bringing out in his wonderful book, tracing the historical relationship between the Greeks and the Romans, and also through this, albeit very quick, overview of Daniel 2, 7, 8, 11, and Revelation 13, the prophetic relationship between the Greeks and the Romans as well. The Romans conquered the Greeks, and so they're their superiors on the battlefield, administratively, building-wise, but when it came to culture and philosophy, the Romans never conquered the Greeks that way, okay? The Romans were simply an outgrowth of the Greeks, so Greek philosophy didn't die. Uh, and what, what, what this is saying here is that Roman Catholicism is imbued with Hellenism, with Greek thinking, and it is impossible to understand Catholicism without Greek thinking. I first launched into this with my students several years ago, and I knew I was jumping off the deep end because you, in, our, in our Adventist schools, we usually don't study philosophy, and for good reasons, uh, because it's, it's very easy to go off the beaten track, especially if you're not guided by the sola scriptura principles in your understanding of philosophy. And so we, we don't usually do that. And, uh, but, I, but I think it's much more dangerous to put your head in the sand and not know what philosophy is and, and what kind of impact that it makes. All right, so um, again, it, it's, it's impossible to understand these things. Uh, we'll talk about what dualism is, but these guys, some of these guys were from the West. When you think about Parmenides, you've probably thought of, um, and I can't believe uh, his name just, just slipped my mind, Pythagoras. Uh, Pythagoras was also in Italy as well. All right, so you know him as a mathematician. He was actually a philosopher as well. So without uh, with uh, so without this, this backbone and this frame, it's hard to understand Catholicism. And without this, without the dualistic philosophy of Greece, Catholicism simply implodes. It ceases to exist. Um, and Catholicism pro processes all of its doctrines and practices through this philosophical framework, which, has made, which the emerging church has assumed, and which we as Adventists do not understand very well, and that's why, in my opinion, we're incredibly confused about the emerging church and about how to do worship in general. We're looking to culture, we're looking to all these things. Uh, you know, when you talk about worship, that's really what I'm focusing on in my dissertation. Worship includes five indispensable components. And without any of these five indispensable components, you do not have worship, okay? The, the most important one is the presence of God. Without the presence of God, there's no reason to worship. 
But worship involves more than that. The second component is the, what the, the liturgists. In other words, the guys that are up here, whether it's playing the piano or singing or teaching or preaching, the guys that are enacting the liturgy. Then there are the ritual actions. The ritual action I'm performing right now is teaching or preaching or some version of the two. But the ritual actions include the architecture, they include the, mu they include the music, and so forth and so on. Then there's, an in then there's an encounter between the divine presence and the worshipers. And then there is a response to that encounter. There's five moving parts, okay? And whenever you have a multiplicity of parts, my next question is, how do they go together and why do they go together in the way that they do? Without understanding philosophy and its impact on Christianity, that question cannot really be answered. And when people ask you why you do the things that you do, it's very difficult to give an answer. Okay? And so what we have assumed as Adventists is that, look, as long as the 28 fundamentals are there, and as long as, you know, preaching and all that is kind of fundamental, then, hey, the rest of what we do is completely up for grabs. Where did that structure come from? Okay, is that the result of biblical thinking or has that been the inroads of Greek philosophical thinking? All right, so the structure and anatomy of Greek philosophy. Okay, in pre-Vatican II Catholicism. Okay, here's a little philosophy 101 here. Um, have you ever heard of Plato before? Okay, not Plato, but Plato for the kids. All right, all right, Plato. Um, he theorized that there were two worlds, okay? two distinct worlds. Well, there's the world of ultimate reality. And in the world of ultimate reality, there is no such thing as any succession of time. Because the Greeks looked around and said, you know what? We age, we decay, we die, you know. I mean, this thing, time, is, is, is and how we relate to it is imperfect. There must be some world that, that possesses neither time nor space, where there's no succession. And that's what he concocted. By the way, there is no such world where, there, where time and space do not exist. Okay? If you read your Bible, there's no such world as that. Uh, in heaven, we experience real things. We do things. We, we do things in sequence. We'll actually be worshiping God every seven days, according to Isaiah. All right? Uh, so there's no such world that exists, like Plato has said. Uh, the earthly is the near duplication or the perfect duplication of this heavenly reality. All right? Um, take Pythagoras, for instance. Um, you know, if I, were to draw, if I were to draw the number two up here, and I drew the number two, and then I erased it, what happened to the number two? Well, Pythagoras would say, well, there's a, there is a timeless number two. So you didn't erase the number two. It exists in some timeless realm. And the literal number two, like two apples, if you eat two apples and they disappear, you haven't destroyed the number two, according to Pythagoras, all right? Because in this world of ultimate reality, which, by the way, doesn't exist, uh, the number two is there. So everything you see on earth is a near-perfect duplication of this heavenly reality, all right? And so the one world up there is perfect, eternal, and unchangeable. By unchangeable and eternal, they mean there's no succession of past, present, and future. It's very difficult to conceive because everything we come into contact with has a past, present, and a future, all right? Aristotle said, I'm sorry, you know, his pupil, his star pupil said, I'm sorry, Plato, you're wrong. There's only one world, okay? But he took Plato's heavenly world and he put it into the earthly. Uh, an, interest, er, uh, an easier way to understand that is the whole concept of the immortality of the soul, all right? Um, According to this theory, we're composed, reality is composed of matter and then your timeless immor immortal soul, okay? So you have, there's actually two, two realities within the human being and two realities within all of nature as well, okay? All right, so what, what are the effects of philosophy on Catholic doctrines? There's bas there are basically two, two effects. You know, they began to describe God and all of reality this way. God is completely timeless. Now, you know, there's a modern definition or a contemporary definition of timeless. Like you look at a piece of music written three, four hundred years ago, and you'll say it's timeless. And what you mean is that it can be appreciated in every century and in every generation. That's not what we're talking about here. Okay? So when you see the word timeless, it means you cannot move from past to present to future. 
And so God does not interact in time and space. And to make it even more complicated, he interacts within time and space. What they mean is that he interacts in an instant. But you say, well, wait a minute. I, I mean, I have a stopwatch that, that can measure time in like, you know, hundredths of a second. When they mean instant, they mean that God does not act in past, present, and future. For you, an instant still means past, present, and future. For them, it doesn't. So he acts spiritually and outside of time or within time, all right? Humans are the combination of the timeless immortal soul and the body. Here, the timeless soul is essential, which becomes the place where God communicates with you. So you don't need Christ. You don't need anything. You just... God communicates with you directly that way. Uh, um, uh, and, and of course, souls have priority over bodies. A timeless God and the timeless soul form the foundation for mysticism, which is, which is the very foundation of the emerging church. Okay? It's, it's, it's the rock bottom structure and foundation of the emerging church, which then explains, as you stick around later on, why they pray the way they do. Okay? So this impacts their methodology of prayer and how they become spiritual and how they worship and everything else. Without this, it's kind of hard to explain why they do what they do. And if we're not careful, we'll fall into the trap of, hey, we got the 28 fundamental beliefs. This shouldn't make that much of a difference. And it's kind of like saying there's no relationship between the foundation and the structure. If I build a six-inch six inch foundation, how many of you are going to put a skyscraper on that? And so if we can become aware uh, kind of of how this works, then we'll begin to ask the, 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 those kinds of questions. It's like, okay, well, hey, what, what does this imply about the nature of God, the nature of human beings, and how these things work? All right? Okay. Um, also, okay, so if this is true, then Scripture is made up of timeless truths that are wrapped in temporal historical garb. Okay. All right. So... Not only is the human being a combination of the timeless and the temporal, where you got a timeless immortal soul and the body. The consequences of that for the emerging church is what you, how you dress, how you eat, what you do, doesn't matter because your timeless soul is good and indestructible. So if it's good and indestructible, then it matters not what you do. Does that make sense? It doesn't matter. But all of reality is pervaded by something timeless and something temporal. Even this. Take, for instance, the creation story. Coming from Greek philosophy, Augustine, 5th century major, major theologian, he, he reads the Bible and he says, yeah, Lord, I know the Bible says seven days, but in my inner ear, you're telling me it was instantaneous. Why? Because Augustine doesn't believe that God can act in the, in the time-space continuum. He believes that creation took place instantly. Well, what about the seven days? The seven days are Moses' cultural understanding of how creation took place. Okay? So there's a timeless truth in the Bible. And by, by, the, time you, you know, by the time you apply this to the Bible, you can shave about 90% of this book out. Because <laughs> there's only a few timeless truths in there. And the way you apply it to creation is that God created. Instantly. The seven days, that's Moses' cultural understanding. Well, what about the Sabbath? Well, the Sabbath rest is essential, but the day one worships on is not because God doesn't interact with time, and so therefore, why would God take seven days to do something when it's impossible for him to do that? It must mean that the rest is important. When you rest is not that important. Now, if you're thinking that, that Protestantism has solved all these problems, I mean, that's straight up Aquinas, and that's straight up Martin Luther. Unfortunately, that was his view of the Sabbath. All right? Baptism is essential, but the mode of baptism is non-essential. Worship is essential, but how, when, where one worships is not essential. In other words, this is how these ideas then will pervade and become a part of uh, how we do what we do. Now, the world is also a combination of timeless essences and substances and matter and history. Now, 
in pre-Vatican II Catholicism, such as in post-Vatican II Catholicism, the Eucharist, which, you know, we don't, we, we don't use that word. We use the Lord's Supper. Uh, that, that's the, the celebration of the, of the Mass. The Eucharist is composed of a timeless substance. So if I had a piece of bread up here, when the priest pronounces those words, this is my body, the substance of that bread changes into the substance of the divine human Son of God. That's what's called transubstantiation. It means a change at the level of the substance. It is impossible to understand Catholicism without Aristotle. But that's not the extent of the damage that it does. As I mentioned, there are five moving categories in how we do worship. This philosophy, when introduced, pits certain things against others and says, this is important, this is not important. Your soul is important, your body's not important. Creation is instantaneous, how it took place isn't important. Uh, baptism is important, but how, how, this is how the whole thing works itself out in the, in the system. Okay, and this is referred to as the real presence. And do you know why people are flocking to the emerging church? Uh, and don't confuse the emerging church with mega churches. I was just in Chicago. Have you ever heard of the, the Willow Creek Church in Chicago? All right, big, huge church that everybody goes to. And, but, but people that are authentic are looking for something more than just a superficial, um, you know, you're greeted with, 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 uh, you know, with coffee and donuts when you come to the door. People are looking for something. They want the real presence. That's why they come to worship. They, they want the real presence. And the emerging church is offering them the real presence. Or what they think is the real presence. And their interpretation of the real presence has not changed from Catholicism at all. As a matter of fact, um, when they have music in their worship services, do you know what they call music now? Musical transubstantiation. Are you following? So, you don't need the Bible. You have the presence of God just by the music. And some people are thinking that the whole idea of music is, is something that is culturally determined or should be solved by musicians. Nothing could be further from the truth. If music is a part of reality, then reality has been interpreted by philosophy. And Catholicism, using Greek philosophy, has interpreted reality. And that is the real presence that some people think they're getting when they experience the music. And so why read your Bible? I mean, why should I read my Bible when I have the real presence in the music? All right. So the Catholic Church adopted this framework to explain what happens when the priest consecrates the bread and the wine during the Eucharist. The change occurs at the level of the substance. Now, okay, let's move forward centuries. Evangelical theology, philosophy, and... Um, the Sola Scriptura principle. The Sola Scriptura principle is something that we've inherited from the Protestant Reformation. And we, we couldn't be who we are without them. There's, it's just impossible. Unfortunately, um, they pointed in the right direction, but, I mean, just decades after the Protestant Reformation, you have Protestant scholasticism, which is basically they're using the same methods as Roman Catholics in their theology at that point, okay? So, if you're under the impression that evangelicals and Protestants go by the Bible and the Bible only, let me dispel you of that very quickly. All right? Because the logic is, hey, we don't, well, Catholics, okay, they go by the Bible and tradition, the Bible and philosophy, okay, they're up front. Protestants, no, 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 no. We, 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 we assume we go by the Bible and the Bible only. But uh, increasingly, more Protestants are giving that up anyhow, okay? That's, that's, they're giving that up. So, although the reformers affirmed the Sola Scriptura principle in theory, they denied it in practice. Evangelical theology has worked under the assumption that God is timeless and the soul is timeless as well, something they never got from the Bible. Those two fundamental presuppositions about God and man color how you interpret everything, absolutely everything, okay? So for the most part, evangelicals have always done theology on the basis of philosophy. That's Greek philosophy. 
Since Greek philosophy was absolute and eternal, yet in ways that contradicted the Bible, evangelicals felt that they could still use it in the centuries after the Reformation. However, with the advent of postmodern philosophy, the, the evangelical church was at a fork in the road. The problem with postmodern philosophy is that it denies absolutes. Okay, so I'm not talking about Protestant worshipers that are in all the churches around here. I'm not even talking about the pastors, the Protestant pastors that are in the church around, churches around here. I'm talking about the theologians who are the thought leaders that, 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 that get their inspiration from the philosophers, all right? This is who I'm talking about. At that fundamental level, evangelicals have done their theology on the basis of philosophy. There's a change then that happens when postmodern philosophy comes around in that it denies absolutes. Problem. How then do you borrow a, a philosophy that denies absolutes to talk about an absolute God? Extremely problematic. They're at a fork in the road. So they're either going to come to the Adventist church or they're going to go back to Rome. And that's exactly what has been taking place. Since evangelicals profess that God and Scripture are absolute, they couldn't use this. Okay, so either Adventism or, or Rome, and their fateful choice led, the evangelical, led to the evangelical attraction to pre-Vatican II Catholicism. Although the emerging church grew out of charismatic worship, emergents have become dissatisfied with the with the music-driven entertainment worship of the contemporary megachurches. Now, if you just take a superficial view and you compare the megachurch, you know, how they do church, with the emerging church, you're, th you're going to think that there's, you know, these guys are the same. But at, 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 at a fundamental level, they're extremely different. So these guys are longing for an experience of God's presence through pre-Vatican II worship and spirituality. Okay, so let's look at the emerging church and pre-Vatican II Rome, some of the doctrines and practices. We'll look at the doctrine of Scripture brief, briefly, and then in corporate worship, we'll look at the Eucharist and music as being central and the Scriptures being diminished, and then pre-Vatican II spirituality. Okay, now the emerging church even calls it ancient future. So in other words, they are combining ancient rituals of the past with modern rituals that are taking place here and right now, like this Christianity Today article, The Future Lies in the Past. Um, and so this is taking place, I'm going to briefly summarize this just for time, at Wheaton College, which is a Protestant uh, um, in institution. And, uh, you know, they're, they're all singing together, emergence and so forth and so on. Uh, and one person says, you know, what, what, what's happened in, in, at Liberty University or uh, founded by the late Jerry Falwell, you know, they're, they're, they're beginning to observe Lent. You know, have the Catholics taken over? Who would have thought a decade ago that, that the most vibrant, serious field of Christian study would be the ancient church fathers? Now, they're not talking Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay? That's not the church fathers that they're talking about. They're talking about after the death of John, okay? Those church fathers. Um, they say all signs point to the maturing ancient future church. So what to do? Easy, says the movement. Stop endlessly debating and advertising Christianity. Just embody it. Embrace symbols and sacraments. So here's the tie with the ancient church, okay? So they're embracing symbols and sacraments, you know, dialogue with the two ancient confessions, Catholicism and Greek Orthodoxy. Recognize that the road to the church's future is through its past. Break out the candles and incense and pray using the Lectio Divina. That's a form of contemplative prayer where you're actually not thinking about what you're praying. You're using vain repetitions in order to turn your brain off, in order to, in order to come in contact with the presence of God that is within. That's, what, that's what's taking place. So, basically what's happening here is that the evangelical church is looking back to pre-Vatican II Catholicism and its worship forms and is combining them with, with the craziness of all the rock jazz music today. So those two things are being combined and expressed in the worship service. Okay, are all roads leading to Rome? Okay. What about the doctrine of Scripture? Well, Brian McLaren, you know, you know, the new Moses that is supposed to bring the, you know, the evangelicals out of, out of traditional Protestantism, says the Protestant Reformation separated two brothers, Scripture and tradition. These brothers aren't the same, but neither should they be enemies. Hmm. The Eucharist and music is central in worship. With the Eucharist, there's transubstantiation, and with music, you have musical transubstantiation. 
That's the sacramentalization of music and the real presence. But the real presence is defined on the basis of Aristotle. And the real presence is confused with nature, which is extremely problematic. And the music is all kinds of rock, rave, uh, you know. The, the Eucharist is mixed with Catholic traditions such as Taze music, rituals, icons, chants, prayers, and all, all within a mixed media context. Um, in pre-Vatican II, uh, uh, how would you experience worship as a pre-Vatican II worshiper? Well, um, the Eucharist, but very few people understood Latin. Uh, so how, how do you understand a worship service that, you know, where, you know, where the guys are speaking a foreign language? That's because you're not supposed to understand. That's not the purpose of worship. Okay? In brief etiquette, you must experience. And as soon as you see that Eucharist lifted up, you have the assurance, you have the presence of God, that's all you need. You don't need to understand. I can identify with this as a young person. I was, I was raised Greek Orthodox. And when, whenever, whenever I ask my parents, why do they do this? I don't know. Why do they do that? I don't know. Why do they do this? I don't know. Why do they do that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Religion is not something you're supposed to know. You just experience it. That's it. And experience is at the heart of the emerging church. So you have the spirituality of the desert fathers and contemplative prayer, etc., etc. Okay. Just a few more minutes here. This is just proof that if you don't believe me, traditional Christian theology has been shaped significantly by Platonic philosophy. Significantly, okay? All right. And I'm going to have to just zip through, zip through this because uh, some of it is repetitive. Um, now, in the emerging church, it says all of life must be made sacred. Sacralization in emerging churches is about one thing, the destruction of the sacred secular split of modernity. What do they mean by that? What they mean is that the presence of God interpenetrates all of reality and makes everything sacred. Okay? That's exactly what they mean. I don't know if you're comprehending this, but this is huge. Okay? This is huge. You might as well throw the Sabbath right out. Do you know what the Sabbath tells you? That there's, there's a distinction between the creator and the creation. You know what they're telling you? No. That isn't, you know, that, that isn't the worst part of it either. So everything must be made sacred. They're talking about an interpretation of the presence of God that, that does not square with what the Bible teaches at all. That is extremely problematic. You chuck the Sabbath, you chuck the Sola Scriptura principle. I tell you what, this is a change at the most fundamental levels. It will completely change us as Adventists. Completely. All right. So yeah, the Eucharist is, uh, is at the basis of this. And, and this, is, this is just a quote from a, uh, from a uh, panentheist. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, basically, okay. In the Roman Catholic worship service, the bread is transformed into the substance of the divine son of God, okay? So the presence of God was localized in the Catholic worship service, okay? It wasn't everywhere. After Vatican II, the presence of God is everywhere. It's interpenetrating everywhere. And so what this, what this guy is basically saying is that uh, everything then has the potential to become a full vehicle of the divine. Why? Because the divine is already within it. That's why. All right? And so that matches with the immortality of the soul, etc., etc. And I'm going to end with this, a statement from the Great Controversy, which basically says this. It is as easy to make an idol of false doctrines and theories as to fashion an idol of wood or stone. I remember when, that, when I first read that, because most of our concepts of idolatry have to do with some physical thing that you're bowing down to, all right? By misrepresenting, notice what she says, the attributes of God. Satan leads men to conceive of him in a false character. With many, notice what she says, a philosophical idol. Very important choice of words. A philosophical idol is enthroned in the place of Jehovah while the living God, as he is revealed in his word in Christ and in the works of creation, is worshipped by but few. I want you to notice the relationship between the concept of God and worship. Did you see that? 
by misrepresenting the attributes of God, you not only conceive of him in a false character, you end up worshiping that. But if you ask most people, are they going to say, hey, I'm worshiping nature? No, of course not. They're going to say, I'm worshiping God. But philosophy has done such a wonderful job in reinterpreting all of reality, including God himself, that no one's going to say, I'm worshiping some idol. But this is what she's saying. Thousands deify nature. What does that mean, to deify nature? That means to imbue nature with divine qualities. And when the emerging church says, we want to make all of life sacred, what they mean is that they're deifying nature. Okay? Because the substance of God, the presence of God, is infused within all of nature. So thousands deify nature while they deny the God of nature. Though in a different form, idolatry exists in the Christian world as verily as it existed among ancient Israel in the days of Elijah, the God of many professedly wise men, of philosophers, poets, politicians, journalists, the God of polished fashionable circles, of many colleges and universities, even of some theological institutions, is a whole lot better than Baal. <laughs> Little, okay. <laughs> Little better than Baal, the sun god of Phoenicia. That's the great controversy, page 583. That's why, in my opinion, the lady's a philosopher and a theologian. But it takes an understanding of philosophy in order to understand why what she's saying is so true. So she's not some devotional writer. She's a philosopher. She's a theologian. And if we, if we accept the emerging church, the Sabbath will be forgotten. Notice what J. N. Andrews said, quoted in the Great Controversy. The, the true ground of divine worship, right here, not of that of the seventh day merely, but of all worship is found in the distinction between the Creator and His creatures. This great fact can never become obsolete and must never be forgotten. That's exactly what will happen, though. We will forget. I hope that you're looking forward to the next presentation. Thank you for giving me, uh, giving me this time. Ooh, one minute to 1045. <laughs> so appreciate your patience. I look forward to meeting with you, talking with you some more. Uh, may the Lord lead us and guide us as we, as we will continue.